Home movies captured unique and very personal accounts of life on the land. Farm machinery has been preserved on celluloid, so too has the livestock. Cattlemen have faced huge changes in the last 80 years. What they've done makes an extraordinary story. How did we get from pedigree cattle reaching only to the stockman's waist to beasts up to a man's shoulder? You can see it now when I move into them. How did we go from animals butchered behind the high street What can I get for you, madam? to supermarkets? And why are the farmers who ploughed out the bracken looking to a new way to save hill farming? There's probably where the, the future of British agriculture lies, clover. This is the story of agriculture. Come on! From the stockman's point of view. All the stock is checked uh, once a day. But this is a tale of cattle breeding over 80 years and how it's influencing the beef that's reared today. Robert Parker is checking a new arrival on his beef farm in Scotland. And then it'll be, uh, just hang on. He crosses two of Britain's proudest native breeds, Scotland's black Aberdeen Angus and the red and white cattle from Hereford. Robert's calf is the product of a 20th century revolution. By crossbreeding Aberdeen Angus and Hereford cattle, he has transformed his farm. Compare these films of Hereford's back then and now. Pedigree bulls have leapt in size from being only up to the stockman's waist to being at their shoulders. The Herefords were originally large, but over the years breeders changed them down, then up again. The same happened to the size of the black cattle from Scotland. Both breeds have been shaped by wars, changes in diet and government influence. Robert's changes reflect the latest shift away from beef in bulk towards quality. One of the best things I like about these two breeds coming together is the calf vigour. I mean, this calf is basically just an hour and a half old. It's been up, it's had a suck, it's on its feet, it's off with its mother. I think it's great to see a nice calf running with a good heifer. Uh, but yeah, you see, you see the pound signs going around too. You know, it's, it's money every time a calf hits the ground. Oh boy. Huh? Well, I see you've got plenty to go. Eh? We're going to discover how Robert, on his farm overlooking the ferry route to Northern Ireland, has re-examined 80 years of cattle breeding to meet today's demands. Just like Robert, Colin Wright, here watching himself on a home movie, is another witness to this cattle revolution. Hello, this is the fella. This is the fella. <laughs> this is when we lived in the village. Colin's coming across to work. In 1939, the Wright family took over the tenancy on Warp Farm, 220 acres of East Yorkshire, near the River Humber. There we oh, are. There we are. There's Colin on his... This was just the time when the size of Britain's native breeds was being reduced. There is Bull. There he is, look. There he is, just gone through. Mm. Here he is, the lad. <laughs> <laughs> He's just cracking the whip round. <laughs> look at that, that's how he should ride a horse. We know, we know. One hand. Well, this is a piece of thin rib or an oven buster. Margaret is cooking the Wright family's favourite joint of beef. That's, that's sufficient. The British love of the Sunday roast earned us a nickname. <laughs> the French refer to the English as les roast, roast beef uh, because the English did traditionally eat very large quantities of beef. Past one, it should be done. The Wrights have farmed here since 1939. Then it was a mixed farm, like so many before the last war. 
Part of the mix on farms like this was animals for the butcher. Yes, yes, here's the bull. This 1937 film gave cinema audiences a glimpse of life on a beef farm. The new bull is making his majestic arrival. A pedigree Hereford bull arrives to father next season's calves. At the other end of the farmyard, the year's crop of bullocks go off to market. They are scenes echoed today at Warp Farm. But Colin saw the 1937 world swept aside and the cattle change. Getting the bullocks or stores off the market is always an exciting job. <laughs> this history of British cattle is told in the show ring by Mike Keeble. breeding as we know it in all species today. In his commentary, he tells the story of the two breeds at the heart of this program. The black Aberdeen Angus and the red and white cattle from Hereford. He's been part of the team at the Great Yorkshire Show for 15 years. It's something I do every morning when I arrive. Um, when we're doing the Yorkshire Show, judging starts normally at about 9.30. And the first thing I do, I come and walk around what I would call my parish. That's around all the cattle. He links the fortunes of the two breeds to the influences that shaped modern farming. You can do your own judging, you people round the ring, in the Hereford. Mike explains how social changes before 1939 led to the cattle being bred smaller. Well, the cattle got small mainly because the South American market, South American beef production, the pampas of South America was very attractive to a lot of British people in the early 19th century. And they went out there, families like the Vesties and many more, and built up huge meat interests. And they were exporting meat back to this country. And when they started doing that in the 19th century, the houses in this country that were the big beef buyers were large families. They had staff in the house and the joints of beef were pretty big. But during that period after the First World War coming up to the Second World War, um, staff went out of houses, families tended to get smaller, uh, and th the beef industry had to change. They wanted smaller joints. We can pick up the story of cattle in 1937, when this cinema short was made. The son of a beef farmer is getting the chance to visit one of the great pedigree herds in Britain. Morning, mate. Morning, mate. He'll see where breeding stock for the Southern Hemisphere comes from. He's just received a notice of the next meeting of the Young Farmers Club, a sort of club run by the local agricultural organiser. The members of this class get a chance of learning more about their job of farming. Why are you going to share them? Captain Dick De Quincey is regarded as a legend in the pedigree cattle world. Bill! Bill! His herd of Herefords was called the Vern. Young Farmers Class is just arriving. You already? Yes, I'll get the bulls out for him now. Good. He was famous for breeding smaller and smaller cattle. Good afternoon, Mr. Evans. I'm just getting the bulls out into the paddock now. The young farmers then, and young farmers today, share the same task, to judge pedigree Hereford stock. If the boy in the 1937 film was here today, he'd recognize the cattle's red and white coats. But their size and their shape would shock him. Got a nice head, he's got a bullish face. They're all quite good bulls. Now lads, you will judge this ring of five Hereford bulls and place them in order of merit. I place the five bulls in the following order. Two, three, I place this class of four Hereford bulls in the order of B, A, X and Y. Two, three, five, four, one. Since 37, pedigree breeders have been at work on De Quincey's legacy. We're looking at uh, this bunch of yearling bulls, I would think they are.
Captain Quincy was a very shrewd man. He looked straight for his market, and he was looking where the money was. You know each other. And he cleverly got into the, uh, the South American market, which was growing at the time. So what did you like to do? It was said that they needed a, a small carcass in order to be able to hang them between the decks of the ships as they came over, because when you think about it, they were slaughtered, and the carcasses were put straight on the ship, and they were matured for three weeks, coming over, over the water. What was happening in Argentina was just as true for Australia. Australia has nearly 14 million head of cattle on the hoof. The Aberdeen Angus and the Hereford are bulls that followed the British colonists around the world, did remarkably well all around the world. And so we outsourced beef production, we sent out the really high quality genetic material and then brought back the beef. By the 1930s, Britain had become the stockyard of the world. When the cattle have been drafted, they're taken to the meat works for killing. The electric saw, an Australian invention, divides the beef carcass into sides. Australia pays rigid attention to the quality of the beef necessary to suit the markets of Great Britain, because England is Australia's best customer, and she consumes approximately 80% of the world's export meat. In those pre-war years, Britain was worryingly dependent on food from the Dominions. In 1939, the Wright family moved to Warp Farm near the Humber. Now that's Grandpa on his horse. This is Colin's father. They call him Grandpa Wright. He spent three years in Australia. Then he came back, married my mother. And then in 1939, they came here. That's in May 1939. Well, I was three years old then, and I've been here ever since. <laughs> He'd ranched out in Australia, and when he got his cows and his horse down, down there, he just thought he was back in Australia. <laughs> New Zone was just a small potted version, you know. <laughs> Me. <Well. laughs> just with the horse, Grandpa's just got off. Oh, there's Grandpa with the cattle on the front. Now they're just just where they are now. Look, just, to just there. Oh. He wanted to have a lot more cattle. Of course, that was in May, 1939, and war broke out in September. After that, he did what he was told. The beef industry was paralysed. The export of breeding bulls was impossible, and food imports were all but stopped. When we hit the Second World War, we came to uh, at as low as about 50%, 55% self-sufficiency for British food in this country at the beginning of the Second World War. And suddenly, God, we've got to produce more home-produced food. The ploughing of land that had never been ploughed up before. And so you had this call to dig for victory. Farms were surveyed by the War Agricultural Committees to ensure every productive acre was used. You were told what you had to grow on your farm. If you, you had too much grass, it had to be ploughed out. And we have Ministry of Agriculture, of isn't it, MAP? And it tells you what was on Warp Farm in 1941. The two acres of peas that we had to grow. And if you had any moles and rabbits and rats and mice... And The priority was to produce milk and wheat for bread. Beef was well down the list. Grandpa Wright was ordered to plough up his grassland for crops. Is everything that was here in 1941? Well, Gram Grandpa wanted it all to be grass. I mean, there was a lot of uh, rough grazing and, and things down there and that, but it all had to get ploughed out when it was wartime. The result is that we in Britain are growing more food than we did in the last war, and probably more food than ever before in our island's history. This in the middle of the greatest war of all time.
British farming celebrated the peace at the first post-war royal show. After the war, the beef industry had to rebuild. Britain was bust. There was no cash for imports from Australia or Argentina, so the policy was to increase home production. The 1947 Agricultural Act consolidated the lessons of the war and offered farmers subsidies to achieve it. Our two beef breeds, the black Aberdeen Angus from Scotland and the red and white beasts from Hereford, had their own part to play. Farmers were paid a subsidy to cross them with dairy cows and produce beef calves for fattening. The government wanted to get more beef into this, into this country, home production, home produced beef. And the way that they could do that was to ensure that dairy cattle, apart from producing their own replacements, could also produce as a byproduct beef cattle. So therefore, if they put beef bulls on the dairy cows, the Shorthorn, the Frisian, the Ayrshire and all those, then they would improve beef production in this country. But how did they know that the beef bull was being used? The pioneer breeders had discovered a genetic gift and it was seized on by the new team of government bull inspectors. A Hereford bull always passes on his white face to his calf, no matter what breed he's mated with. And an Aberdeen Angus bull will invariably sire a calf with no horns and a black face. One look and the bull inspectors could check that a farmer had used a beef bull rather than just any old bull. So those two breeds got a very big boost during that period, 1945, 1955. In the Welsh hills on this beef farm, the old film brings back memories of the time when the little black cattle ruled the farmyards. Here is a typical bull, a potent sire, God, look at him. bite as a child. Yeah. Neville Stacey remembers those days. He uses a modern Aberdeen Angus bull. But he's forgotten how small the bulls once were. Look at this, Mark, and I say, what have we got here, a basset hound or a bull? <laughs> but he's a little bit too rotund for the modern market. Little daylight below him. He's as broad as he's tall, isn't he? A bull at the end of the day is kept to mate and impregnate a female. I think a lot of the modern cows this little chap wouldn't be able to mate with the modern cows unless you're going to put a block under his back legs to help him work. His legs are short and well planted at each corner. It was 1965 when Neville and Margaret came to their farm in the Welsh hills. They spent their early farming lives reclaiming the hillsides and improving the pastures for their cattle. This is Curzon Entertainer. Curzon Entertainer is one of Neville's modern Aberdeen Angus bulls. Got a pedigree as long as your arm. Whoop, stay, girls. He's quite interested in one of the females at the moment. He doesn't want to be messed with me right now. When Neville started farming, the drive for production was in full swing and Britain's uplands were part of it. To increase our food production, we must use all the land we can. And every farmer who's willing to reclaim marginal land gets back half the expenses a government grant. When I first came back here 40 odd years ago, where we're standing now, I would have been standing up to my shoulders in Bracken. All this ground across here was covered in Bracken. A very exciting time to be farming because as a young man we were draining these patches, we were ploughing, improving, increasing the stock. Ten years ago when I started to improve the hill land, most of the slopes were covered with bracken and wind. The film you saw is exactly what was happening in this mid Wales area. Bracken is poisonous to cattle. But ploughed in and reseeded, new grass pastures spread across the hillsides. Yeah, I mean, we, not only him, I was paid to do it. I was encouraged to do it financially. 
wasn't so many years after the, the last war, when people were really hungry. As well as grants to improve the uplands, hill farmers received a subsidy for every breeding animal they kept. Under the 1947 Agricultural Act, when production was subsidised, um, there was a headage payment on the number of sheep kept or the number of breeding suckler cows kept. It encouraged people to keep more sheep and to keep more cattle. In October, the cattle come down from the hills. One of the things it did, it enabled farmers to maintain profitability. Neville's early farming life, a thousand feet up on the Welsh hills, was shaped by these subsidies. They ushered in an era of intensive farming across the country. On the other side of Britain, on the flatland by the Humber, new machinery and new ideas were coming to Colin Wright's farm. Colin's cutting the hay. It was a good little mower. This home movie was made in 1966 by a friend to capture scenes of farming in the year Colin took over from Grandpa Wright. They're here, father and son having their bait. Aware of it drinking, drinking. again. Well, <laughs> you see, this is what happened with this filming, like. They only ever come down to, to film us when they came down to bank drinkings. <laughs> and so every bit of film has a bit of drinkings on it. <laughs> Once we got through that period of the Second World War, um, that was over, but we were facing a whole eastern bloc which was still threatening us. And we knew that our food supplies could always be threatened. We had to keep up that food production that we'd established during the Second World War. There's Grandpa pulling these two trailers with old Herbert sat on top there, because that would be where he finished loading. The whole way we do things has changed. I mean, that's making hay. We don't make hay now, we make haylage. Haylage, a drier type of silage, was part of the production-driven post-war revolution an advance that produced better feed for the increasing numbers of livestock. People did begin to understand that if you put heaps of grass in a relatively air-free environment, it would preserve itself. But silage really began to develop because the technology caught up. We suddenly learned that you could harvest grass much more quickly. We could grow much heavier crops of grass, which indeed were very hard to make into hay. We're, we're putting the wrap on to seal it up, so keep the air out of it. Otherwise it would go rotten. New machinery, along with chemical fertilizers, was a partnership that drove up production. We didn't have nitrogen fertilizers until we had a petrochemical industry and then a byproduct of the oil industry has been nitrogen fertilizer. And that had a tremendous effect to boost agriculture. Farming went from being mainly small farms to being something which was bigger and bigger farmers all the time. The weight swung from a largely tenanted farming sector to owner occupiership. It was a very exciting time. The Wright's Yorkshire farm was rented, but in 1958, Grandpa changed all that. It was the year we were going to get married, and he bought the farm. And I mean, he, it, we'd been tenant, I mean, we bought it for £6,700, was it? £27 an acre. £27 an acre. Well, that wasn't buying it, we were actually pinching it. And even then, he didn't have the money to put down for it, but they lent him it, did the estate. Ashdale Estate Company. Company actually lent him £500, or was it, or whatever, to, towards, because he was short on the 
6,500 or whatever it was, and he paid that off over five or six years. It seemed an awful lot of money, and I mean, it won't buy an acre today, and there's 222 acres. British agriculture was getting bigger. Farms were bigger, machinery was bigger, yields were bigger. Everything was bigger except the Hereford and the Aberdeen Angus cattle. After the war, Britain regained her status as the stockyard of the world. The pedigree breeders re-established their trade, exporting small bulls to the prairies and the pampas. Prices could reach 20,000 pounds. In 1966, the pedigree world came to Hereford. Captain Dick de Quincey, the legendary Hereford breeder, had died, and cattlemen assembled for the sale of his famous herd. Well, today the cattle sale of the century will take place when the famous Vern herd of Hereford... They're so short. Julian Gallimore was at the sale of the captain's pedigree Herefords. They're so small when you look back on them. It's comparison to what we have now. The sale has become a turning point in the story of the modern Herefords. Julian was once the auctioneer. He's retired now, just a ringside observer. But the art of spotting bids was honed back in the 60s. The Vern Herd was the creation of one of the greatest cattle breeders the world has ever known, Captain De Quincey, who died last year. Mrs. Gordon, the, uh, the stockman's wife, leading the first bull round. Brilliant. To look at this vast congregation, my father uh, there selling, many of them just to look, but uh, many of them to try and buy. There is a photograph of me uh, wearing glasses. Altogether, the buyers have paid about $700,000 for the various animals. And the highest price of all, over $47,000, as a matter of fact, a world auction record, was paid for Vern Scorpio. To average just about 1,500 pounds for everything, calves, cows, it proved to us, proved to me as a, as a relative youngster, that Herefords were supreme. But the triumph masked a threat. Britain's native breeds were about to fall foul of a new drive, a fight against fat. In the 1950s, we began to really study and get an understanding of the impact of diet on health. Before then, food was something that kept you alive. We were beginning to see the problems. And one of the biggest problems was saturated fats. Now, saturated fats mostly come from grazing animals like beef and sheep, and the traditional British breeds, the Hereford and Angus, were easier fattening and therefore did carry a lot of fat. The bulls the post-war government had seen as a solution to increasing home-produced beef had now become the problem. The challenge for government was to produce beef with less fat. And so when the Coma report came out, the question was asked, what are we going to do about it? And it was decided we could do it genetically, we would have to, but we could speed up the genetics by actually doing it using imported cattle. Because cattle like the Charolais, coming past me now, were a breed that hadn't been bred for fat. They'd been bred for size. They'd been bred for pulling things and pushing things. And they developed much more lean and much less fat than our breeds. And they'd maintained their size. So that In 1961, a group of Charolais bulls arrived on trial. A decade later, Mike was on the committee that reviewed the experiment. It was chaired by Professor Ian Holmes. The Holmes Committee, which I was the sort of new kid on the block on, I was the youngster on the Holmes Committee, um, they came to the conclusion, yes, we should import more continental breeds, and hence the next importation in 1971 was Limousin, Blonde Aquitaine and Simmental cattle. And that being overtaken now, given a lead, it had a remarkable effect because the imported breeds added that size, they added that growth rate to our beef production system. And they bred cattle to produce that extreme beefness, that huge loin and that huge back end. 
Well, you won't see a finer lineup anywhere in the country than the one you've got in front of you now. By the late 1970s, continental invaders were replacing the Hereford and Aberdeen Angus bulls. Today, a Belgian blue presides at Warp Farm. He'll father calves that will produce the less fatty meat customers have been taught to choose. Oh, we'll take, we'll take cow with this way. Colin this and his son Neil are selecting cattle ready to well, go to not, market. She'll not grow any more because she's how much else down in her. Neil would never be anything else but a farmer. He's nice shape, he is. I reckon he'll do right well at market. He's got a hell of a back end on him. He was never wanted to do anything else. Why, well, it's like, Neil on his bicycle. Oh, he's throwing stones and, and things. He's, he's acting for the camera. <laughs> That's what he's doing. He's going for ice cream now. Now this ice cream van started calling on us when we first got married 50 years ago and it has just been retired last year as that van. The Wrights bought their farm in East Yorkshire in 1958. Since then they followed the trend and expanded production. They changed the cattle, they improved the land and they started to grow cereals for their cattle. This is uh, feed barley. It's grown for uh, feeding the bullocks. This is the same field where Grandpa Wright once kept his cattle. In those days, it could take up to four years before they'd be fit for the butcher. The beasts this barley is for will be ready in about 15 months. It's not too bad a crop to consider in this field was not but marshland before we drained it. Them days, that, on that film, it was the old uh, tractor drone class. Colin's just li lifting off a sack of stuff there, and he just looks up and he's in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> Lift me cap. That's right. Right, right, we'll go on. How are you in heaven? No. <laughs> He's just laughing. He would, it would, it would, it's a lovely, lovely piece. This was the way the beef industry was moving. More barley was being fed to cattle. Barley speeds up growth and puts a layer of fat on the beef. That's where the taste comes from. We imported the continental breeds because we wanted animals that didn't get too fat. We almost immediately found that they didn't get fat enough because these big breeds, the Charlie and the like, were never bred to produce the roast beef of Old England. Most of them were actually draft animals bred to pull ploughs and the like. And you can't finish them in the traditional ways at pasture. So we went for an animal that didn't produce enough fat and then we found it didn't produce any at all, so we had to feed it barley. The Wright's barley-fed continental cattle are on their way to the butcher. They've grown quickly. They are over 500 kilos. One beast will cut up into about 600 meals. The buyers are judging the price they bid on the shape of the beasts. Is it carrying lean meat in the right places? Will there be a lot of fat to cut off? They'll pay about £900 per animal. As these continental invaders moved into Britain in the 70s, so did a standardised way of assessing the carcasses. This, this is a way of describing the shape of the cattle. It starts with E, which is the best, and then goes down through E, U, R, O, P. A Europe grid with E for the biggest and leanest, and P for the skinnier carcasses. On the E side, 
we'd be uh, looking at the Continentals, uh, Belgian Blue, down into the Ars, where we're coming to the better end of the Angus and, and some of the Hereford. And lower down still, once, oh, once again, still some of the Angus and Hereford. Below that, we are getting into uh, dairy, dairy crosses. The Europe grid brought Britain into line with the continent just at the time we joined the common market. And just as the bull subsidy scheme of the post-war years had given the Aberdeen Angus and Hereford bulls a boost, so in the 70s the Europe grid turned the tables on these native breeds in favour of the big European cattle. It's 20 past one and Margaret's joint of beef is ready for the table. And that's what you call a oven buster. <laughs> My favourite piece. It's one of the joints that comes out bigger than it goes in. Yes. <laughs> the Europe grid helped turn beef farmers against the smaller, fattier native breeds. We're mostly Belgian blues and uh, they are a lot leaner. Butchers like them because that's what they can sell. They have to have what they can sell and that's what we have to produce. These breeds produce meat in bulk and with less fat. If you look at them, they've that big back end. And that's where all the top side is, all the dry meat. <laughs> By the 1980s, the big beasts from Europe had become dominant. Is Colin, get, Colin getting a bit? It's summertime in Scotland and Robert Parker's newborn calf has grown. She's nearly three months old. Robert is moving his herd to new pastures. We've got a fresh bite of grass. We try and move them around every two or three weeks just to get them a fresh bite. Until recently, he'd farmed in the same fashion as the Wrights at Warp Farm. He crossed a Charolais bull with cows from the dairy herd and finished the calves on barley. Then he spotted something in the data. And uh, I got the figures back onto the computer here. He'd bought a few cows that were Aberdeen Angus cross Hereford. And then I noticed something to do with the breed of the mother, which is also in the, on the spreadsheet. He compared when their calves were ready for the butcher with those from his dairy cows, and there was a big difference. The ones with the Hereford Angus mothers fattened 40 days quicker. The 40 days at 10 to 12 kilos a day is nearly half a ton of barley, so that's roughly about 60, 70 pounds, uh, just because she had a different mother. His data showed that calves from Aberdeen Angus cross Hereford mothers were quicker at converting food into beef. It's something the ranchers back in the 30s would have known. Robert won a scholarship to travel to the Southern Hemisphere and discovered that the sons of the cattlemen who had imported the bulls back in the 30s were crossing the two breeds to produce what's called black baldies. Their black coats from the Aberdeen Angus, their white so-called bald face, that trait always passed on by the Hereford bull. This is not a new system. This is basically what the rest of the world does. Uh, and uh, I mean, I've, I've travelled and I've seen it working and uh, it certainly works really well. The new bull is making his majestic arrival. But Robert couldn't have changed his cattle unless the pedigree breeders had improved the bulls since the days when the old films were made. He certainly wouldn't be using a black Aberdeen Angus bull if the size of the breed hadn't been restored since that low point in the 1960s by breeders like Willie McLaren. That was me when I was 16 year old. That's what I mean when I talk about belt buckle cattle. I was just a 16-year-old boy at the time, really. <laughs> On his farm in Perthshire, 
William McLaren has played a leading role in increasing the size of the black cattle. In those days we were talking about belt buckle cattle, and you see where he's coming up to me now. But uh, they talked about belt buckle cattle, and, and that was down, down here. For a comparison in size, there's a picture of me holding my hand up with a bull which was double the age of this one. And my hand's are way up here. And you can see how small he is because that's my hand up there. He was probably the shortest legged bull that I actually ever produced. And then this is the most extreme one of the lot. He was actually almost three year old when this was taken. So 64 was really when we hit the, the bottom of the trough. A 40-year task lay ahead. This film was taken in the 70s. It shows Willie with the small cattle. This is back in 1977, and it shows me and another breeder assessing the bulls at the bull test centre in Aberdeen. It was when everyone was leaving the breed that Willie took the biggest gamble of his working life. I decided instead of going into another breed in, 19, in the 1980s, that I would buy the best cattle I possibly could. I saw this bull in Canada. By the time I shipped him in, it cost me 30,000 pounds, which was a tremendous gamble. And it's just the same in the stock market at the present time. Those that are brave enough will take a gamble and buy the shares that are at rock bottom. And they're the ones that's going to have the best rewards. Willie had made his high-risk investment. He'd have to wait for his return. The beef industry was changing. No longer were animals slaughtered behind the shop. The way meat was sold changed. High street butchers gave way to supermarkets and customers were removed one more step from the process of putting food on our plates. The butcher's van was parked up for the last time and meat began to come in pre-wrapped packets. The product had to have eye appeal. It had to have the right pink colour and be lean to catch the customer's eye. Beef out of all of the red meats is probably the one that raises the most emotion in customers' minds. It's what they used to have when they went to their grandmothers or it's whether their way their mother used to, to cook Sunday lunch. It's the emotion around that and it comes out in beef more than any other red meat. And the family joint is ready too. But that sentiment and the industry were about to suffer a kick in the teeth. After the debate about fat in the 70s and the early 80s worries about red meat, a time bomb exploded. About 1984, 1985, BSE hit us in a big, big way. The pictures on television of cows falling over, it was a clearly a horrible, horrible disease of cattle. BSC was a problem of the dairy industry. It was a problem of feeding uh, bits of cattle back both to dairy cows and their young calves taken from them at birth. And in the public's mind, it was unnatural. Cows are supposed to eat grass and aren't supposed to eat bits of other cow. The government at first tried to reassure us that this was only a disease of cattle, could not be transmitted to humans. And then, of course, we found that it could. My wife is... Um very worried about this mad cow disease and I think that for the time being we won't buy beef for the time being. It completely blocked all exports of British beef. It could have completely crippled the beef industry. In fact it didn't. Um, it, it, there was a drop which was from about 20 percent which was sustained probably till about 1995 which is quite a significant drop but for a disease which has an incubation period of many years, really the, the real blip only lasted about six to eight months, which is, just shows how irrational people are. For the Aberdeen Angus breed, this disaster proved to be an unexpected opportunity. 
that one, wasn't it? 108, wasn't it? In the 1990s, David Gunner, a supermarket supplier, was part of a partnership that took up the cause of the little black cattle. The breed was largely grass-fed and so less associated in the public's mind with BSE. And as this 1959 film, made by butcher Peter Colebrook, argues, it had an advantage over leaner meat. The flesh is fine-grained, with an abundance of marbling. Those flecks of fat he was pointing out held the taste. The task of the industry was to rebuild confidence and to rebuild a confidence in the industry through things like traceability, provenance, but also a, a bunch of people, some people perhaps more forward-thinking than others, had been realising that some of the things that Peter Colbrook was talking about were actually things that we'd lost and ought to try and get back to. In good quality beef. And is a feat. David's father was a butcher. He knew Peter Colebrook in the years when the small native breeds were still feeding the nation. I knew him. Um, he was a lot younger <laughs> in this film than when I knew him, but he was a friend of my father's. Uh, and they worked together on carcass competitions. Ready for transport to the retail shop. David Gunner reassessed the values Peter Colebrook stood for, taste and texture. In 1991, a partnership with a big supermarket was the start of sourcing beef from native breeds. So in terms of how that compares with what customers were buying in the 50s and 60s... Heather Jenkins was instrumental in putting Aberdeen Angus and Hereford beef on the shelves and behind the supermarket counter. What can I get for you, madam? Um, can I have two of the ribeyes, steak, Two ribeyes, please? madam. Thanks. The industry had to find a way of doing what the traditional butchers had once provided, a direct link back to the source of their beef. To do that, we had to ensure traceability of the bulls, of, of the cows that they were, um, the, the calves were coming from, and the whole traceability right through the system, and we've done that since 1991. Superb. Thank you very much indeed, madam. Thank you. The supermarket is our link with the production chain. We don't see, we don't go on the farms, we don't see the farms anymore, but we do go into the supermarket. So if we're going to trust the provenance of our food and the quality of our food, the people we really have to trust are the supermarkets. In the livestock country of Mid Wales, Neville Stacey was one of the first to join Heather Jenkins' scheme. He bought a black Aberdeen Angus bull in 1990. He's had an eye on the quality market since. This bull here, he's only young, but you can see his back is broad and there'll be a tremendous amount of meat along that top line. And when he's finished, he'll cut out some very nice soil sirloins, which are the high value cuts. BSE was a classic and very dramatic um, demonstration of how, in the public mind, how unnatural intensive farming had become. And so there was a great yearning for more natural schemes, of which, of course, suckler beef out on range or on the mountains is a quintessence. Neville is getting the grass in for winter feed. He's seen big changes since he moved into the hills. The old films told a story of how farmers were paid to reclaim the uplands and turn them into pastures. It was part of the post-war drive to increase farm output. BSE changed the public debate. Over 20 years, Subsidies moved from supporting production to backing environmental schemes. Probably a traditional hay meadow. Now, Neville Stacey, the man who spent a lifetime increasing the number of animals on his hill, gets grants for growing flowers. After years of increasing production, what does it feel like to turn his grassland back into traditional meadows? That's a rather an emotive question. From a farming point of view, who's always been seeking production, it seems wrong. But 
from a business point of view, the present times when we are being encouraged now to go down this line, uh, yes, it's all right. We'll take a, a useful crop of fodder here, which will keep cows. And this is where the native breed cow is coming in. She's able to convert this type of forage into production and to grow her calf through the winter. So when I look at it from that point of view, yes, it's all right. It's been an exciting farming time, but I suspect a lot of what we've been doing as time goes on will not be sustainable because of the oil. Now Neville has gone organic. The crops we are harvesting here today, compared to what we would have been doing 10 years ago, we're probably harvesting a third of what we would have been then. The old ways are being relearned. There's probably where the, the future of British agriculture lies, clover. There's one that's in flower. I suppose they're a chemistry factory in themselves. And as much as that'll fix nitrogen through photosynthesis from the sun. Neville is responding to history and reinterpreting the knowledge of yesterday. And we've seen the same with the cattle. The red and white Hereford and the black Aberdeen Angus. I happen to believe, it's rather perverse this, but I happen to believe that the continental invasion actually was the saviour of many breeds, but in particular the Angus and the Hereford. In the 70s, Willie McLaren bet the farm on a hunch that the little black cattle could make a comeback. Well, this is a six-month-old heifer calf, which weighs 340 kilos, which is pretty close to what the yearling weight was for a bull back in the 40s and 50s. He gambled that he could get the cattle from the size of this calf held by his granddaughter to the stature of the bull being led by his son. Now here we're bringing up a yearling bull and it just shows you how much the breed has progressed. This is what we call the belt buckle cattle at this age. Whereas now we're up to what, probably shoulder high. You can see the difference in even only just 40 years of breeding, the difference we have changed this Aberdeen Angus breed. Three generations of McLarens and 40 years of breeding have affected a revolution. And it's been done by measuring. First recording heights and weights, and now they even look under the skin. This is the big one. This is measuring the eye muscle area. So he's looking at the muscle between these two ribs. I'm looking for this movement up and down in the corner there. That's his rib eye steak. This is the data that's changed the breed since the low point in the 60s. My thinking at that time was if I stuck with Angus, I could get size to compete with the Continentals and also with the quality in the meat. That, that's what I set out to achieve. And I was kind of out in a limb for a number of years, but uh, I, I can now say that I have no regrets in sticking to them. <laughs> Another important part of the, the breed plan people going around is we'll measure the scrotal circumference of the bull's testicles because it relates to their fertility when they're working later in life. And he is the widest point, 42. 42 is a good, a good measurement for an Aberdeen Angus, which was that size. <laughs> I'm a bigger boy than you think, these other fellas. <laughs> Robert Parker is looking for a new bull. It's a nice straight bull. He do the job fine. It's probably too expensive for me though. <laughs> He's seeing what the McLarens have to offer. We always do a deal. <laughs> the bulls are here for sale, and that's always what we do. So. On his farm, he crosses Aberdeen Angus and the red and white Herefords. But can he afford this bull? 
he just uh, is he about the kind of three thousand there? Is he? About, but a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he would be he'd be four thousand. I could have thought so. that. <laughs> Robert is using the new bigger bulls to meet the demands of today's beef industry. From the 70s, the continental cattle delivered meat in bulk. That's a good taste. Mm -hmm. what do you think about this it was bread lean and taste suffered. Tender or tough? It's slightly tough. Mm. <laughs> it's a fair with that one. Uh -huh. Now a group of farmers are doing consumer research. Robert is part of the group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've got a machine that bites meat to gauge its tenderness and they can measure taste as well. They want to adapt the 1970s Europe grading grid. That system, which favoured the bulky carcasses of the continentals, to include a taste and tenderness measurement. The Europe grid, I mean, when it came in, I think it was, it was needed. It really was needed. I think at that time, native breeds were quite poor on the actual meat yield. And the Europe grid has done exactly what it was designed to do. The problem is that it's gone so far that the producers are actually focusing so much on producing this fancy carcass that they've forgotten actually it's, it's, it is about eating quality. You know, it's a consumer that's going to eat that eventually. Um, the new grading system, if, if we manage to get something in, would take this into account and hopefully reward farmers for eating quality and not just yield. It's the end of the year in Scotland. Roberts brought his spring calves in. These are this year's calves. These were all born April, May, so they're about eight months old now. They'll spend the winter indoors eating grass silage. But first, Robert clips them to stop them overheating. This stops them sweating too much in the shed. The calves will grow on in the shed. The cows will winter outside. This has been an 80-year story of the cattle that have shaped farmers' lives and stockmen who have shaped the cattle's fortunes. In it, there have been quiet revolutions and a rediscovery of old values. I think the future is quite rosy with beef of known provenance from the hills seen as this luxury product you eat when you go out into restaurants and also as a part of an overall stewardship of some of the loveliest country in the United Kingdom. <laughs>